Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, are we uh, creating Wally -E or HAL 9000? So that's a, a scary notion, right? Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what I'm doing uh, at Surf and what we think the future is going to be like. So forgive the Gen AI, uh, it's obviously hallucinating. I guess that's, that's going to be a theme. Um, right, so who am I? My name is uh, Peter Boers. I uh, work at Surf. Um, I'm a dad recently. Uh, I've got a background from the US, Australia, and the Netherlands, so don't mind the accent. And I've been working at Surf for the past seven and a half, seven and a half years, uh, background in software engineering and network engineering. So, and I learned yesterday that that combination is apparently a unicorn. Um, so, uh, tech leader of the Workflow Orchestrator program, so uh, representing that, and we were very grateful that we had the opportunity to uh, do the workshop on, uh, on Tuesday. So, currently working on, well, at home, trying to understand what make babies tick. Um, and he's, he's seven weeks old, so uh, he, I'm also struggling to get good night's sleep. But uh, he likes showers, so that's, that's a good thing. And, and sometimes uh, it feels a little bit like this as well. So, uh, yeah, you know. Um, okay, so at work, this is sort of my day job, right? Working on the next generation of Cirque's, Surf's network, um, trying to start thinking about how we can start introducing AI into network automation uh, and network running the network. And I think one word sums it up, it's, it's called AI ops, right? So AI ops is what I'm going to, trying to talk about today. Um, so any ideas of what it is, right? So what is AI ops? So from my perspective, um, and not only my perspective, this is what Gartner says, uh, AI ops combines big data takes machine learning and uses that to enable and help engineers, right? Um, because of all the stuff and the workload that we have these days, we need all the tools we can get to get things done, right? Um, and this is always good to have like words and pictures. Um, big data comes in, you observe it, you use AI machine learning, so that's different compared to Gen AI, right? It's actually trained models, machine learning, statistics. You use that information to act upon it and that goes into a, into a, into a cycle that keeps on repeating. Um, so why, why is this something that we need? Because, you know, I'm an awesome uh, network engineer or maybe a, a software engineer. I, I have plenty of skills to solve my problem. Well, the thing is, um, this is, we just don't have enough human resource. That's, that's basically the problem, what's, what's going on. And AIOps is something that we're going to need to, uh, to be able to innovate in the future. Um, this is statistics from the Dutch uh, Bureau of Statistics. And basically what it says here is that um, people are working longer and, they are, uh, and, and more people have a job, right? And this is the other thing, for every uh, 110 vacancies, there's only 100 people to fulfill them, right? So there's just not enough people to do the work that there is out there. Um, and AIOps is, is, is going to help us. So another quote from Gartner, uh, there is no future in IT operation that does not include AIOps. And uh, this is due to the rapid growth in data, volumes, uh, data volumes and the pace of change, right? So, so things need to move, we need to be able to react quickly, and probably we need something that's going to help us react faster than we're already reacting at this point in time, right? So, if you think about this, three quarters of people in this room are probably already using it in some way, shape, or form, and it's probably going to be chat GPT or maybe an image generator, or maybe you even use something that helps you generate uh, firewall filter rules, or maybe if you're a, if you're more of a developer, use Copilot, right? So there is, in some way, shape, or form, there is going to be AI uh, used in your in your daily workflow. And you know, it it also has a little bit of a a dangerous feel, right? So um, uh, is it something we're gonna gonna feel, right? And and um, uh, is it going to take our jobs? 
Um, you know, that, that could be like a worst case scenario. Um, and we do trust it a little bit, um, but if you go further and further along this path, um, what if it takes control of the network and, and do we, um, um, yeah, will it break it, right? How can you control it? How can you make sure it, it does what it's supposed to do? So, yeah, and this is something, this is a theme that Hollywood has uh, really looked into uh, for a very long time, right? And they, they show us both sides of AI and artificial intelligence uh, regularly. And yeah, I think uh, one example is the Gen AI scare last year. So the actors and the writers, they, they all went on strike, um, but they made a lot of bucks on the, on, on the theme of AI as well, right? So these are all the movies that they did and they even started in, 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 the, in, the, in the 30s of, of, of last, last century. So and I'm gonna talk about, well, HAL 900 in this slide, but it's obviously HAL 9000 and, and WALL-E. Uh, and they, one is uh, from 1968, it's a movie from Stanley Kubrick, and the other was uh, by Pixar in 2008. So the fundamental thing that you're sort of trying to answer, right, and uh, what they are trying to answer, uh, and also in, in AI when you create machine learning and stuff, is, is are we creating something good? Caring AI that's going to look after us, make us feel warm and fuzzy uh, with who you can identify, right? Or is it something really, really scary, right? So, and this is, this is the best attempt that uh, Gen AI was able to produce when I prompted it with, please give me a, a cute and cuddly image of HAL 9000, but you know, this is it. So, and, and yeah, and HAL 9000 is, is a cold-blooded, you know, rational, task-oriented machine. And um, he, really, uh, he, re he really had it in for his, uh, for his humanoids. So, and the thing is that Wally and HAL 9000, what do they tell us about AI? Well, it's both stories with uh, robot characters, okay? They're both dysfunctional in their own way. Um, it's good versus evil, right? Stereotypical. And one is very highly specialized. I mean, he's a robot, he just compacts trash. Uh, that's Wally, obviously, and the other one has total control of everything. Um, and uh, yeah, should we be scared of both or just the one or the other? You know, that's, 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 a, that's a question. So a little bit about the characters in this story. So I'm sure quite a lot of you are familiar, but I'll just, just do a recap um, and then you can sort of uh, understand why this is interesting. So HAL 9000 is an AI from the story uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. And it's something that they, uh, that was uh, written in, or, or was produced in 1968 by Stanley Kubrick. So HAL 9000 is the, the, the robot that controls the spaceship Discovery 1. And this, uh, this spaceship is on a, uh, on a, on a mission to, dis, uh, to explore Jupiter. Um, and his directive, so this is the reason why he exists, is the accurate processing of information without distortion or concealment. So, you know, that sounds pretty good, right? Um, but it goes horribly wrong, right? So he starts malfunctioning due to an order that contradicts his directive. And what was that order? Well, someone, for reasons of national security, hid the existence of an extraterrestrial anomaly to this crew, right? And this has sort of triggered uh, something that let HAL become the archety archetypical uh, evil AI, right? Which we're all scared of. And um, yeah, he even kills part of the crew. So yeah, and, and, and in, researching this, um, in researching this talk, so I came across sort of a little bit of theory. There's been lots of stuff on the internet about um, about what actually happened to Hal. So, so who recognizes this, this picture? Yeah. So, so this, is, uh, this is by a Dutch artist, Maurits Escher. And does anybody know what this actually represents? Yeah, okay, yeah, Perpetuum Modulibene. But on the other hand, what it also represents is a strange loop. So and this is actually what happened to, to Hal. 
And this is the interesting bit, right? So it's also called, known as a Hofstadter Mobius loop. And um, the, the definition of that is a paradoxical level crossing feedback loop. So what, what does that mean? Well, it's a series of levels in an abstract loop cycle that cycle around onto, the, onto itself. So I'm gonna try and explain this. Uh, so bear with me. So take this sentence, right? And if you read it, you understand what it means, right? And if you think about that, um, how, do you, how do you actually read this? Well, you, you take a sentence, you say, L, this sentence, this sentence is false, okay? And when you read it the first time, you're gonna evaluate it, and you're gonna evaluate it as that you interpret it. So, and you're probably gonna take it for face value, right? So you're gonna say it's true. But if you continue, that means that this sentence is false equals to false, right? So that's, that's how you start. But if you continue, and this is the self-referencing loop, okay, so this sentence is false, is now actually false, but if you look at what I did there, if you evaluate that again, suddenly what is, is written down is actually true, right? So if you, if you see what happened there, this is, sort of, this is sort of something coming back on itself again and again, and you can do it again, right? So apparently this sentence is true now. Well, actually it's not, because when you do the exact same exercise and you read it for face value, it, it goes to false. And this sort of happened to how, or this is, the, this is the theory that people are writing down on the internet. And yeah, it's actually pretty tragic because, um, you know, he, 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 he kept on, he had this directive where he was, he, he was supposed to be honest, he was not allowed to hide something, but his, someone told him that he should. So, should he or shouldn't he? And he kept on feeding back onto himself. Um, yeah, and, and he could have told the crew, like, I have this directive, um, not, that, that on, the, on the one hand, I, I should be honest to you, but on the other hand, I've been asked to hide something from you. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's difficult, so how do you break that? And well, that's how, right? So and Wally, I mean, he's a fuzzy, fuzzy character, right? So he was he was built built to help us um, clean up the earth. Um, but yeah, he 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 after 700 years being on Earth, he was the only one left, and he glitched. He came uh, he became something with uh, some a, a robot with a, with with a character, and able to to think for himself. Um, one of the neat things is his best friend, his name is Hal, so I wonder where they got that from, right? Um, and uh, yeah, eventually he falls in love with another robot and he saves the earth and it's all, it's all great, right? And he, he, he's the he's archetypical hero. But if you think about it, um, they all started their lives being created for, for a good thing, right? And they, they, all, they both malfunctioned into a stereotype. And they also had human-like feelings and traits uh, and had free will. But, you know, if you think about it, Hal didn't really, wasn't really free and, and Wally either. I mean, he, he had sort of like a dysfunction where he had to compact trash. That was sort of what he had to do. And he didn't feel happy without doing that. So, yeah, and this is another parallel. So these two characters are obviously the same. One's from, uh, from Wally and the other one is the, uh, the prototype uh, prop that they took... Uh, Using, uh, using the film. Um, yeah, so what do those stories tell us? Um, the, the AI, when people create it, they probably don't have any intent um, and they, they'll probably work well when they're supervised. Um, and yeah, if you neglect it, it's gonna break and it might break in a scary way or it might break in a very fuzzy, cute and cuddly way, right? And um, the thing is, how are we going to make sure um, that we stay in control? So these are all the questions that I'm trying to answer when, when thinking about this, is like, how, how, how are we going to be able to create something that is actually going to help us and, and really make sure it, 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 helps, it helps us innovate and create better services for the future? So. We need to understand AI to be able to control it and use it to its fullest potential. I think that's sort of what, what both stories can tell us. So, 
what now, right? So what, why am I telling this story? Well, I work for CERF. Uh, CERF is the National Research Education Network of the Netherlands. And at CERF, we believe that AI is probably going to help us deliver the next paradigm and shift us how, how we can run our network. And we're, we're a network with a very dynamic and mixed use case. Um, and as you saw with the employment statistics early on in this slide deck, we probably need all the help we can get because we can't uh, hire the people to actually run it for us. Um, and yeah, one of the other key things that we uh, want is that this model, this AI that we're going to use is going to be open source because we probably won't be smart enough to create it ourselves, right? So we need, we need all the help that we can get from the community to, to actually build this thing. Um, so our ambition is to have an intelligent network capable of correctly accessing incidents, fixing them in real time by using AI ops. This is sort of our ambition level, right? And I don't know if we're going to achieve it, but uh, who knows, right? And when you create an intelligent network, it, uh, it relies on a sane data architecture and reliable sources of truth. So, so if we, we have a fully orchestrated uh, shop, so everything is provisioned through our workflow orchestrator, and um, all our data is sane, right? Uh, we have 100% coverage on every single service that we provide to our NOC or to our uh, end users, and uh, even operational tasks are managed through our workflow orchestrator. And because we've achieved this, we have a very precise definition of what correct data is. It's all labeled correctly, and we can start leverage that, leveraging that information and on that operational data as well um, to uh, feed the AI that we're trying to build. So the other thing is that an AI ops type of algorithm needs is uh, clear use cases and well-trained algorithm. And there are a couple questions that we need to answer here because intelligence is relative, right? So how far should we go? Um, training the algori algorithms towards the wrong out outcomes is not intelligent at all. And, and you need some checks and balances to make sure you don't create your WALL-E or your HAL 9000. Um, so so this, these are some questions, so, so these are some questions that need to be answered before we can start running this in production. And yeah, so uh, recap about SURF, I uh, didn't, didn't tell you that much about it. So we are a national research education network, so very similar to Internet2 or Energy Sciences Network or Géant or take your NREN of choice in the country where you're from. Um, we handle the traffic of around about 9% of the Dutch population every single day. Um, and if you look at what we do, um, it's, it's all based on eVPN and uh, layer 3 VPNs and that, that type of stuff. So it's very standardized, it's very easy um, in that sense, but if you look at our customer base, it's very, very, very uh, dispersed, right? So on the, on, on the one hand, we have high energy physics who need large, large amounts of data traveled, transported around the world, uh, but we also have vocational schools which, who are very happy with just a one gigabit uh, Ethernet connection and uh, and some internet. So, yeah, um, and our network that we're running at this point in time is is called Surfnet Eight. Um, it's uh, it's ready for a renewal, um, and our cu current network architecture is very ho homogeneous, right? So it's it supports any device and any service anywhere. It's very easy to maintain. Um, but it's, it's quite rigid in its architecture. Um, and in our next generation network, we're going to move towards a network that is uh, heterogeneous, right? So it's gonna be multi-OS, it's gonna be multi-vendor, it's gonna be disaggregated. We're probably not gonna upgrade our access, but we are gonna do our core first. Um, and um, yeah, we hope to move towards a way of upgrading our network uh, by, um, by not upgrading it in Big Bang anymore. So we, we previously had iterations of network and now we're going to move on to something that's going to exist for a, a longer time. Um, and this is sort of our, 
our information architecture, right? This is the, the driving force of our software. Um, and it, it's, it can be complicated, um, but on the other hand, it provides us a layer of uh, distance and a, a layer of APIs that we can start using to uh, leverage, uh, yeah, leverage the AI and stuff like that that will be introduced into this stack. Um, and I guess we have the luck luxury that way we don't have a long tail at this point in time of old devices that uh, can only be accessed via NetMicro, net net right? So we, we were able to use uh, modern protocols to control the network. So where do you start with AI Alps? Well, we need somewhere tangible and well, we're probably going to do uh, predictive stuff, right? Trend and event monitoring. And traditional monitoring probably has a single dimension, right? Um, so you're gonna say, is my BGP session up? Is the interface up? Are there errors? Um, am I getting the optic values that I'm expecting? Um, so that's relatively simple. But if you think about it, uh, a healthy service that you provide to your end user is probably going to have multiple dimensions, right? So there's probably going to be multiple things impacting the performance of that service. And the thing is, once you start thinking about it, it's not as simple anymore. It's actually quite difficult, right? So how are you actually going to define a healthy service? How are you going to train your AI to understand that? And then continuing on from that, uh, how are you actually going to uh, create something that's going to uh, impactfully fix it if there's a problem. So at SURF, we're just going to try and get the basics right first. We're going to redesign our telemetry platform and make sure we get the right data uh, with the right resolution to, to train the model and um, try and actually achieve this. Keep it, keep it as simple as possible so we can understand what's going on and we don't get the HAL 9000 or WALL-E uh, uh, problem. Um, and there are a couple of high impact use cases, which what we're starting on. So, and it's probably going to be our, and it's going to be our external peerings, because that's that's something. If something happens there, um, uh, we see quite a lot of impact on it for our end users, and it's something that is very visible in our uh, metrics and, and events. And we should be able to create something for that. And yeah, eventually, uh, hopefully somewhere this year or maybe next year, we're going to introduce semi-automatic uh, corrections to fix the problems. Um, and this, this semi-automatic thing is probably gonna be something where uh, we propose an action to the user and the, the user can say, oh, that's a good idea, AI, uh, or that's a bad idea, uh, let's not do that. Okay, so coming back to where I started, right? So this is sort of, our, this is sort of what AI ops is. And this is how I understand it. Um, and this is what it's going to be looking like uh, when we run it in production, hopefully, in the near future. And you can see sort of in colors, we have an observe observability platform. There is some purple stuff, which I'm trying to figure out what's going to look like. And on the other hand, we have the workflow orchestrator, which is going to steer the network and actually provision stuff and, and correct, correct it. Um, yeah, and hopefully in the near future, maybe I'll be able to report on the status of this, which is, uh, which, 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 yeah, in, in the experiments that we've done so far has been promising, right? So that we've already been experimenting with the telemetry we're receiving from our platform, and we're actually seeing quite, well, quite good correlated data that we can use to, uh, to create actions and propose them to our users. Okay, so in conclusion, right? So I'm gonna start wrapping up here. Uh, I've got a couple points I wanna try and make. Um, the thing with intelligent networks is that we need to start small and aim high, right? So AI and is, is something of an enigma, right? And we've had a big discussion at this Autocon about software engineering, network engineering. You know, I think it's something that we probably need to help each other because we need the software engineers to start understanding this for us, and network engineers need to provide us with the right actions that need to be taken when something happens. Um, eventually, uh, when we've done our small thing, we want to be able to have a digital twin um, that uh, we can just use to, to run experiments uh, on. 
for network simulation or capacity planning or you know, traffic flow, et cetera, et cetera. Has to be vendor agnostic, right? So I mentioned already, we're moving towards a heterogeneous network with lots of vendors, lots of protocols. Um, and yeah, we're not looking for awesome AI solution of vendor X, right? That's not what we're looking for. It has to be open source. It has to be open standards and uh, we have to understand it so we can so we can make use of it and we can continue to um, uh, improve the community that we're trying to build here because at some point in time um, vendor x is not going to be part of our network and it's going to be vendor y and that ai thing which we're investing heavily in needs to it needs to still exist so yes obviously a nice uh, gif again uh, or a nice meme um, yeah so uh, we need to as a community uh, start collaborating that's sort of what 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 I'm trying to point out here is that the software engineers and network engineers really start need to helping each other so that we can build this stuff um, so what should you take away well an arti artificial intelligence is the reflections of its inputs and whether it is maintained that's sort of one thing um, HAL 9000, Wally, you should avoid them. Um, you don't want them. Um, you want something that's predictable, that you understand, and that really helps you do your stuff. Um, and AI ops is needed for the main ta mundane tasks on the network so we can tackle the more challenging problems that uh, occur. Um, and we have our hands free and we don't need to do any scraping of the CLI, right? That's, that's something that we want to want to move away from. Um, and I think this community uh, that we're building here uh, should be at the forefront of developing this, uh, this, this, this AI ops momentum, so to speak, for, for networks. Um, yeah, I think there are enough smart people in this room who should start understanding, understanding this problem and how we can fix it. And it says open config here, but you can set replace this for any other um, technology that may be out there, right? I really think we should look at other communities like the cloud native community um, and, um, and, and, and that type of, that type of uh, ecosystem where you see that they're able to create APIs that can be consumed by anyone and they don't need to understand the underlying problems, right? So they don't need to understand the underlying implementations. And if vendors are able to provide us with APIs that always look the same, we don't care what type of infrastructure or what type of um, 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 yeah, box it's running. We, we really care about running the network and providing a service to our end users. That's what we care about, right? Um, so automation enables orchestration so we can unlock the potential of an intelligent network. That's sort of what I think uh, is, is the key here. So that's it. That's all I have. Any questions? Hi. So uh, one question about the open config. You, uh, I like the statement. We would we need to ask the vendors to build it, but open config is there for a while, and the vendors still implemented like five to ten percent of the capabilities on the devices. Yeah. So would it be better idea then to join together, join the forces together here as a community and build some kind of translation on top of it to to battle those? Uh, it's also good. It's also good. That's. I mean. For me, the, the point here is that we need a standardized API, right? We shouldn't be struggling with uh, CLI scraping anymore. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's, what, um, that's what happened in the, in the cloud native community is that they don't care about if your, uh, if your, uh, your workload is running in uh, Docker or C container D or on Podman or whatever. Well, same for if you, use, if you need an ingress uh, to get traffic onto your workload. 
You don't care if it's Nginx or if it's uh, traffic or whatever. Take your pick. What you care about is uh, a standardized API and that you can predictably uh, get something done. And maybe open config is not the right tool. I'm not sure. But it's sort of the, the thing that sort of makes the most sense to me at this point in time. But uh, maybe we can think of something else. No, no, definitely it's a good thing, open config. But I, I'm more uh, onto the point that maybe we should build the layer on top yeah. of the big vendors and uh, maybe we should leverage open config yeah. more. Yeah, well, we saw a good project uh, yesterday, KubeNet uh, from uh, from Nokia. I think that's 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 probably a way forward, right? Um, but there might be an, an, another another tool as well. Yep. Uh, I couldn't disagree with you more. <laughs> That's what I was hoping for. <laughs> First of all, I think you what it's really important for us to understand the context in which we operate. Microloans were a great solution. The guy who came up with microloans got a Nobel Peace Prize. They tried it in a bunch of other countries, failed badly because the context in which it was is wrong. If you talk to a bunch of people, like I have, I hope, I don't know, maybe my sample size is biased, open config is zero because they have got devices that have 10 years set life. They have been running from 10 years, which is an impressive thing, by the way, the fact that it is, the uptime is 10 years. But it is also the fact that they're not gonna bring it down because if yep. it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. So, and I, 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 so I, the first thing I would really, yeah. really like us to stop as a community is, oh, let's do open config. Oh, let's get a standard API. You're not going to get it. Right. The more we pursue this myth, can the I, longer we will be here. Can I react to that? Because I, I, when I'm I, done, I thought about this and I was expecting this question, so I'm very glad it came. Um, so. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, open config. We have a long tail install base, which is is definitely true. Uh, we need to uh, work with that. Um, but if you don't fix the problem now, you're going to be stick with the same issues in ten years' time. Right? We so had we need, the same problem so from we, SNMP. So it's not to, changed. So we need to make sure that we fix it, and they were able to do it in other communities, right? So there is no reason why we can't. And it's Other a communities it's a work very differently. Nginx people don't sit down and say, how does Fla uh, Flask have to do? Flask does not sit down and say how fast API has. None yeah. of them coordinate in the way you're thinking they coordinate. This is the big problem of the networking community. We somehow think the vendors will get together or we will tell the vendors to get together and we'll all sing Kumbaya. Yeah. Ain't happening. And I'll, sh I'll give you another example of, uh, of something very inspirational. That uh, that we had that I that I that I saw. So at uh, KubeCon 2018, uh, Kelsey Hightower, Hightower, who's staff engineer at Google, got on main stage and called out um, his own people. Uh, and I would re definitely recommend looking at YouTube. So he called out his own people at Google and said, "Look, guys, take a look at what Amazon's doing, and just just help the platform engineers." to deliver services instead of forcing us down a route where we have to learn how Nginx works and how Nginx can be configured, but actually um, enables the, 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 the users to deliver the value to their customers, right? So it's, it's about enabling the network engineers to do automation, and um, we need to start at some point, right? Now we have three different things. Multi-cloud is a myth. Google Cloud does it one way, the same thing. Amazon does it differently. AW, uh, Azure does it differently. And Oracle is doing it differently too. So this problem of what network vendors did is happening in the cloud. And this is real. Yeah. So my point to you is that I think nobody, this attempt to keep on saying we will do things and it will somehow magically work is what is going to stop us on. As I put it, Autocon 21. Huh. Why have we not seen full adoption of network automation? Yeah, and I guess I guess maybe I'm naive, right? And I'm young, so uh, forgive me for that. Uh, I don't have the experience and the gray hairs, uh, but uh, I, I, I do have some hope. So you know. What we can do is learn. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I can have gray hair and be completely 
completely wrong. Arthur C. Clarke, the guy who did uh, Ham 9000, by the way, mm -hmm. it's not Kubrick, it was a book by Arthur yeah. C. Clarke, and his first sure. law was, when a gray-haired scientist says something is possible, usually it is. If he says it's impossible, it's not. But then as a caveat, except for people who continue to see that it's tried and tried and it doesn't work because of the fact. So unless we change something fundamentally, it's not going to happen. Yeah, and that's true. Unless we change something fundamentally, it's not going to happen. And I propose that we try and get together as a community to, to do it a different way. Right? That's sort of what I'm trying to say here. Next question. Was that first something? Oh. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering about the data you were gathering, um, mostly training an AI network or, or a model. It takes a lot of data. Are you gathering enough data from your own network, or are you running simulations in lab? Yeah, good question. So um, we're, we're, we're using, uh, at this point in time, we've been experimenting with uh, two vendors, uh, Juniper and Nokia, and also, no, actually, and also with Ribbon, um, gathering data through GNMI, and also Syslog, and we're feeding that into, um, into the, uh, I'm, I'm getting some help from the HPC guys at, at Surf to uh, to start training the model. And we don't need that much data, actually. So we've, be, we've been doing give me everything uh, as fast as possible, and we're trying to narrow down uh, what we actually need, and we're, we're seeing in the first results that we don't need that much data, actually, to get something, something predictable. So early days yet, so, though, so far. Yep. Yeah, it's... it's with me or now? Yeah, I wanted to be a bridge between Dinesh and uh, Peter uh, because I do agree with Dinesh is that changing the vendor implementation of an open config and stuff like that is, is hard because we have a certain data model and all the applications that sit on, uh, be beneath use it, right? But I think where I'm, I'm leaning towards is the following. You could use an abstract data model that is owned by, the, by someone, right? And probably if, if it serves 70% of the community, and we built, so what happened, in, in my view, in, in the cloud native space, what happened in Kubernetes, for example, they built an API, and all the vendors built an adapter towards that API. So in other words, that would be a way to say, okay, no, we don't standardize on all this API. There is a community who defines, okay, this is an abstract API that serves potentially, I don't know, let's say 40%, or maybe 50% yeah. of the of the use cases of the vendors. And if we, then the vendors or whomever builds the, the adaptation towards that API, I think that's potentially a way forward. Yep. Because at the end of the day, I think when we were discussing uh, uh, Dinesh, you built in SUSE Q that API for you based on the use case and the context that you believe is relevant for that particular use case. So and as a result, if we make that public or if we make that available, we could all benefit, potentially. I completely agree with what you're saying, Wim. You don't mind, Wim? Okay. I thought my voice, as long as it was... <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, so, I completely agree with you, Mike, but Wim, sorry. But let's look at a couple of things. Open config was done by an operator. We are all operators didn't work. Why? Because Google did what they wanted for their specific use case, which is not true for everyone. I think the campus will look a little different. The data center will look a little different. So I think what we really need is rather than saying we will get a standard API, we have an ability. So take a look at data science. So we are talking in all of this, we're doing data science, right? What is one of the standard things that almost every big data model has? They have something called translators. Those translators are not something that the vendors build because they, may, they will not do it for you. We will have to do those things, which means someone, Suzy Q, some other tool, whatever, it doesn't matter, will have to do the screen scraping, come up with a model which looks fine, and then someone will have to take that and write translators or you know what in object oriented program is calling is called a facade pattern to just make those translation that no arguments that i don't have but again we are not relying on anybody to give us a standard api okay. yes i agree with you about it. I, so that's what i'm trying to say yeah, yeah. but, but I, I i wanted to uh, add one more thing 
if I may, right? I'm glad it's Is very that... controversial, this uh, topic. Well, no, no, Thank I think you. I, 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 <laughs> I don't have to do anything here. <laughs> It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's no, about uh, the fact that I do agree campus and data center are different, but if we share a little bit of knowledge, and I'm not saying, so I'm, my 70% or my 50% is what I'm aiming for, because if we can serve a 50% uh, uniformity, yeah, you're done. it might help. Yes, that's what you need. But you, okay, that's where we disagree. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, wanted to bring maybe another perspective in the discussion. So first, I agree with Dinesh, actually. I think the, the myth of having the single vendor API, I think it's, uh, it's bonker. But personally, I think it's even there's another problem. Like, what I've, so first, I'm, you know, right now I'm focusing a lot on source of truth, but I've, I've been working on telemetry for years. It's been, you know, my second uh, biggest topic. And personally, what I feel like what we're missing today is actually a model on how we store and query the telemetry. Because today, OpenConfig, it is a transport protocol. It doesn't actually, like, I've seen multiple vendors, the same collectors, you'll get data in different formats. Yep. Which means that there's is a, a huge problem. task around yes. standardization yep. of how we're gonna represent. Yep. There's no, like, tele, uh, OpenConfig doesn't define what is the label, what is the metrics. Right. And until we actually solve that, it's gonna be really hard to reuse the same collector, the same dashboard, the same tools, the same stack of analytics. And it's something actually, when I was at Network to Code, you know, we were talking a lot about it. We wanted to, um, you know, bring that forward. And I think it never happened for various reasons, but I really feel strongly as a community, we should try to build that, that model. Yep. And then we should have multiple collector implement that across different vendors. I think that will be a great starting point. Yep, I agree. Thank you. Hi, um, I have a question. Yep. Do you plan to use other protocols like BMP or IPFIX to gather the data? Or Probably, yes. Um, okay. At this point in time, we're just starting with, uh, with the GNMI, telemetry, and syslog. But uh, that's, for now, that's enough. And, and hopefully, when we get a little bit further down the line, we, sh we should start introducing other things. OK, and do you use uh, event-driven stuff uh, with GNMI? Yeah, so uh, if I go back to that uh, architecture, architecture stuff, where is it? Yeah, this one. So this is all, all those uh, letterbox letters are, are events that go across the network and go across the application landscape. So, yes. Okay, cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Hello. Um, as a, like a research network operator, um, I know we've got people from Internet2 here as well. Um, and my friends down. I don't know if there's anyone from Arnet here has ever worked from, uh, for Arnet before, but that's another one. Um, you're probably very well positioned to potentially share a lot of the data that you're gathering for the use of training these models. Um, one, are you going to do that? If, if, if you can, are you going to do that? And two, would you open source kind of the labeling of that yep. data to the community? Yep, yep, we will do that. Cool. Yeah, so I have to mention that this is partly funded by the Dutch government and by the European Union. So this 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 stuff is is definitely going to be open source. So yep. excellent, cool. I have one. <laughs> Here we go again. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm trying to find common ground. Okay, so, good. Uh, you said in one of your earlier slides that you know we are gathering data as part of doing this AI thing, and we actually found that we are not don't need to do we don't need too much data. Yeah. Can you quantify that a little bit more about what data? What did you not need too much of? Yeah. For what purpose? So, uh, good question. So, um, I know it's early days, but I'm just wondering if yeah, there's anything no, I, to share. Yeah, I completely understand. So, uh, to give some context, so we were. Uh, we, we first did this experiment with uh, multi-fender uh, telemetry on our uh, recent trial of uh, 800 gig through from uh, CERN to uh, Amsterdam. Um, and we basically said, okay, just give me everything every five seconds, um, which resulted in, well, a few million uh, records per day, uh, which is way too much. And um, you can't. You need a, a big supercomputer facility to process that data. If you get, if you need to get that inside. Um, so uh, I don't know the exact details to be completely honest, because uh, as I said, I'm working with the HPC guys. But he he basically 
told me um, from his experiment that they could probably, we could probably throw, throw away about 90%, maybe even more of the data that we need because quite a lot of the data is noise and not relevant towards the use case that we're tr first trying to implement. Um, and the methodology we're, we're doing is a principal component analysis. So a principal component analysis is something where you take the data that you have and you take a look at what's coming in and you try to, uh, try to uh, see correlations in between data points without, uh, and you can throw away the stuff that's not relevant. So that's sort of what we're looking at. Um, obviously, um, once we start running this in production, uh, we can't say, send me everything every five seconds. We're probably gonna say, you know, send me something on change or, uh, or maybe um, every so often. Uh, to make sure that it's fast enough. Does that make sense? Yeah, but what is everything? So everything is, uh, if you take a look at a Yang model, an abstract model uh, of a router, you can say, give me slash, and it'll send you everything. Yeah. So that's the whole tree. So that's interface, counters, uh, optic levels, but also configuration. Sometimes you also get uh, uh, syslog messages inside the GNMI, uh, GNMI uh, models. Um, so, so, so it's, it's basically every single data point that you can get from the, from the router, um, memory, CPU utilization, power levels, uh, you know, everything, fan speeds, the whole, the whole shebang. Yep. So um, I wanted to bring the focus actually back to Dinesh. I like you in the limelight. And Peter, you talked about open config, and of course, Wim talked about abstract models. My question is, uh, have you talked about IETF models? <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, at, the, at the same level, it's, it's all Yang, right? So uh, at some point, I, I put open config on the slides because I knew it was going to be contentious. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's just a means. That's, that's the thing. It's not, I mean, if we throw it away and use something else, that's fine by me. Um, but the thing is, it's vendor agnostic, and IETF models are also vendor agnostic. Um, and, and, and that's maybe more and that's, complete. And that's, and that's sort of the point here. The point is not what we use, it is the fact what it, bring, what it might potentially yep. bring us, right? Right. Okay, so any more questions? Right. right. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I wanted to also to explore a bit on the AI. So your ultimate use case, as I understood, is mostly about kind of a self-healing network, right? So it's operational support and self-healing. So do you look at any other data, any, any data other than the network data? I will give an example. Um, I'm also trying to build something like this. So we use mm -hmm. Elastic, LK, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we use Elastic as the kind of a data lake for all of the telemetry that our organization has, not only the network. Actually, network is not there yet. We are in progress because it's kind of painful to pre-process network data for LK since NMP plugins are not working very well and all. But what we found is that uh, the network monitoring and observability is pretty self-sufficient, right, within the tools that we have today in our portfolio because it's actually a bunch of protocol. It's not... Uh, the data is not complex enough for it to be processed with AI. However, if you send it into the same data lake where all the applications log, all the other pieces of infrastructure log, yep. you can really build a beautiful correlations there. Yep. Now, what I wanted to say is that, um, like you have a case when you can monitor TCP discards on the spine, right? And you can figure out that something is wrong with your hypervisor. Yep. Now, the problem here, I think that AI would help with is that it's uh, kind of, I guess, ties back to the open config, but different, uh, and I think it's what Damien said, right? So different vendors send the telemetry in a different way. And uh, for every way you have to write your own parser, right? So that's where I could help, right? So get an insights, what your log message, you know, using LLM, figure out what yeah. insights does a log message send and uh, figure out how to parse it automatically. And, Send it in structured way because the further anomaly analysis, it's not a know-how already, right? It's uh, like most of the 
most of the open source logging system will do this anomaly analysis for yep. you. So it, I guess it just was a comment. Uh, yeah, exactly. Question, I was like, the what's question, the question? <laughs> the, question the question was, do you, do you also analyze, are you planning to analyze the information from the other data sources other than the network? Yeah, good question. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's a valid point. Um, and I guess the answer is probably yes, but at this point, no, because we have to start somewhere. But uh, yeah, I, I do see a use case. So we're an ISP, so we don't get like TCP stuff because uh, otherwise we'll be um, inspecting the uh, traffic of our end users, probably not what they want. Um, but there, there, there might be environmental stuff or other things that we haven't thought about yet that we could introduce. All right. Hi. I just um, <clears throat> wanted to ask you a question. I saw that you had L3 VPN as your, one of your services. You had eVPN, L3 VPN. Now, we had a question about IETF models. So um, I kind of wanted to ask you whether you have used any of the, or even considered, investigating the IETF models for those uh, services, because uh, RFC 8299 defines L3 VPN from a customer service point of view. RFC 9182 defines it from the network resource point of view. And then open config really is at the bottom, right, per device. Now, have you kind of looked into that? And is that something that you, you, you know, yeah. going to use in your network? Yeah, valid point, valid question. Um, so to be completely honest, we have our own models, obviously, at SURF, because we'll, that's what we did. Um, and probably uh, we should look at those models. I mean, do you think that there's value from an AI ops point of view in terms of maybe pushing your standardization up the yes, stack beyond just, so. you know, the devices? Yes, I think so. I think uh, that the, if it becomes a higher order abstraction for the um, end users, it be be becomes easier to reason about what you're actually looking at. And obviously there's going to be a lot of implementation detail uh, underneath and lots of translation layers that you need. But if you can look at something and understand and reason about it in a way that is um, that doesn't matter what vendor you have, that would help Quite a lot. So, so you think that perhaps if you did it at that level, you wouldn't have to really care about open config? Yes, correct. Yep. Because you could then, say, take your L3 VPN definition from yep. X network and just yep. say, well, let's do it over here. And yep. as long as they understand how to implement that in whatever devices they have, I don't you care. Don't care. And, and there, there is still, and because it's more or less the same, right, there might be nuance between the implementation of a layer three VPN somewhere else, and there might be some other knobs turned, but the, uh, the, the broader scope of what it is, is exactly the same. So it's just a layer three VPN. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you because I've seen the same in projects I'm working on. I mean, I'm from Juniper Networks, mm -hmm. that's full disclosure. Um, and I've seen the same in projects I've been working on where that, that extra kind of like dimension, yeah. that instead of treating it like, okay, the standard's all this big flat land of devices, that there's actually two layers on top of that. Yeah. And when you start considering those layers and actually standardizing them, you can even forget yeah. About the devices all together. Exactly. Just be like, I want this network. Well, and that's, that's exactly my point. And that you can then use on the AI because that's yep. a standard. You can deviate from it to help, what, even if you make up your own. But yep. the point is it's in Yang. Exactly. But, but you've got to have those layers. So yep. that's been very useful yep. for us. So, yep. yeah. so no, I completely, ex I completely agree with you. And this is sort of also the topics we touched on in the workshop on, uh, on Tuesday is, is you need to have sort of a design and then extra layers because the extra layers will help you reason about things and the implementation stuff is, is it's important, it's very important because otherwise it's not going to work, but it's not something that you're going to expose to your end users at all, right? They're more interested in, okay, I need to be able to turn this knob to make it function for me. Um, they don't care if it's Juniper or Cisco or Nokia or take your pick vendor X, you know. Last question. Right. So, so actually, not really a question, I feel like we're more on a brainstorming, so I wanted to bring one more thing. Personally, I feel like when we talk about telemetry, 
you know, there's a lot about enriching the data. And I think there's a lot about actually getting the information about the topology, all of that, that usually for me lives in the source of truth. I'd love actually for industry to start thinking on how we can have a standard interface on how we can expose the topology data and all the information that are very important to those telemetry stack. Because today, everything I've seen has been very bespoke because we don't have those. We don't, we don't even talk about that. So, so if we could actually expose that in a standard way, then I think as an industry, we will be able to build you know, better end-to-end -end solutions that are not tied to specific vendors or things like that. So I'd love to work on that if people are, are motivated. Thank you, Peter. No worries. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yep.